the trick is, is can you push someone to an exceptional level of performance while keeping them safe? I have a concierge medical practice. I take care of a lot of CEOs, athletes, and people that are really hard charging individuals. Yeah. And a portion of that practice is geared towards special operations. Whether it's keto, vegan, zone, paleo, carnivore, eat right for your blood type. Sushi. Seed oils. The idea that you should stop eating eggs. Inflammation and the omega balance. Insulin resistance. Protein powder. Breathing mechanics. Age-related diet and exercise. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast, or should I say return to the podcast. She's a family practice physician. She's the founder of Muscle Centric Medicine. She's the CEO of Young Medical PC, the host of the new show, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. She's the one they call Dr. Feel Good, and she's the one that makes you feel all right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Got Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. What's up, Mike? How are we doing? So happy I get to see you. I'm glad you came back. Uh, I know that it's been a couple of years now, so uh, a lot's changed. We, we as a country, uh, I'd say health and medicine-wise, which we won't get into uh, <laughs> all the COVID bullshit, but a, a lot has gone on between the last time you were here and now. Uh, and a lot of things, I think, have, have become more kind of pop culture as it relates to health and fitness, um, both good and bad, buzzword-wise and illegitimate versus you know, helpful and legitimate. So I'd love to sift through a lot of that and, and get, uh, get your take as well as, um, you know, get the, the personal update. You've had, you've had two kids since then and, and see what, uh, what the yeah. husband chains up to and, and, uh, get caught up on all that stuff. So, Can't wait. uh, I am curious what the, is there a changed morning routine since the last time you've been here now that you're, you're a mom of two? Yeah. What is a morning routine? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. Four thirty in the morning, just this morning, my yeah. daughter comes in mom is she usually the first one up uh shane actually oh, shane is. shane's oh. up by four jesus i know every morning terrible is yes that the jocko thing or what does he have going on he t he tells me actually if i cared more about my work i would also wake up at that time <laughs> <laughs> time does he what time does he Road or punching. you guys go to bed what time do you guys go to bed he typically we go to bed different times he typically uh falls asleep sitting up yeah uh, between 1130 and 12. Holy shit. He's only getting four and a yeah. half for four. Could you hours please have a, could you please talk to him? Yeah, I'd be happy to, but I mean, if he doesn't listen to you, he's probably not going to listen to me, but uh, this, this, that may be true. Yeah. Um, yeah, go to bed by nine thirty ten, 10. And yeah. my daughter is the sound alarm for four ish. Man. As, and that's, uh, is he getting up seven days a week at four? Saturdays and Sundays? Not so much. Yeah. You know, he's on rotations and yeah. I always, and we actually spoke when he transitioned out. Yeah. I was very concerned about how is he going to do as he transitions from being a SEAL. For the listener who doesn't know, my husband spent a decade at Team 10. And I always worry, how does an individual transition out? And he took all of his skills and just... Put it right to use. Put it right to use. Really yeah. dialed in. He's top yeah. of his class. Yeah, that's awesome. He's finishing medical school. Yeah, that's amazing. It, uh, I, I don't know how he does it. I don't know how you guys do it, honestly, with... That kind of schedule. I mean, uh, like I'm at a point in my life where if I don't get seven or eight hours of sleep, like that next day is is pretty half ass. You know, um, I really notice it. I mean, in my 30s, 20s, like it didn't, I mean, shit, I could get three hours of sleep. It didn't matter. And, and and even in my 30s, like I could burn it at both ends pretty hard for a long time before I would even really start to notice any decreased what what felt like decreased productivity. But now. I mean, it's like uh, I've turned into a total pansy that way. I don't know. It's like if, if I don't eat a certain way and stay hydrated and stay away from alcohol and get good sleep. And I mean, it's just it totally fucks me over. But um, all right. So 430. Is that typically when uh, when the oldest comes in and wakes you guys up? Yes. Yes. So what happens after that? I tell her we're going to meditate <laughs> which and to means go to go sleep. The fuck which, back to sleep. That's exactly what that means. <laughs> which means go to sleep. Don't wake your brother because we have a 16 month old mm. as well. She's, she's not quite three. And, yeah. uh, that's it. And, and I'll sneak out and I'll start, I'll get up at five. Yeah. And then, uh, what, what does that first two hours look like for you? I work. Really? I'm writing Go my right first book. It. That manuscript is actually due October 1st, which it includes a lot of the stuff that you're, you mentioned earlier that there seems to be an increase in narrative and it seems to be an increase in confusion 
of pop culture of yeah. what does it mean to be healthy and should we all just start eating plants and yeah. uh, soften our ways yeah. a bit? Just the narrative. So yeah. The book that is going to be. Do you have a title for it? Or I don't. No, I originally wanted to call it the Lyme Protocol, yeah. okay, but they'll probably change that. They'll come up with like the lion's den or some shit like, like that. that. Make, makes it edgy. Talk about a muscle centric yeah. yeah. uh, approach. Yeah. To um, yeah, no, I, I hear you. I mean, so five o'clock in the morning, that first two hours, you, like, do you drink anything? Do you eat anything? Do you work out? Do you go right into? I highly caffeinate. Really? A lot of caffeine. Yeah. Yes. It's right, it's right next to my bed. <laughs> <Like> <laughs> whether I, it is a iced coffee. Yes. I leave it out. Whether, yeah. whatever it is, I highly caffeinate and, um, just start working. I leave my computer next to my bed. Yeah. Wow. And I start cranking it out because I, by 6:45, I leave to go to the gym. Yeah. And then I go from 6.45 to, from seven to eight, I train and then come back, get the kids ready, take them to school, start working. Yeah. And it's just right back at, at all that stuff. Grind. Yep. Yeah. Back at it and then pick the kids up. I always take the afternoon for the kids and then go back to work at 7 p.m. Wow. Um, do you take the weekends uh, dialed back at all or is it? I have found that I need to. Yeah. Um, I try to take one day off. Like legit off. I, I do. I try. Yeah. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Uh, so during the day, I mean, so you've got, if you could kind of gloss over all of the different things you have going on. So you got, you have the book, you have your practice. What, what all does, does the day typically entail if there is a typical day? I mean, what does it look like? When I think about the domains of my workplace, uh, right, obviously there's the family and that needs to be all tidied up and the kids off to school, whatever they're doing. And then there's writing in the morning. I'm aware of when I'm most uh, capable, mentally capable. And that typically is in the morning. So I, I schedule the morning for writing, writing new ideas, information, because before I go to bed, I'm typically reading, reading literature, reading some of the new science. So I think about it overnight. Yeah. And then in, whether inspiration hits or not, I'm up, I'm up to doing the task in the morning. And then I review patients. I have a concierge medical practice, which as I was telling you, I take care of a lot of CEOs, athletes, and people that are really hard charging individuals. Yeah. And a portion of that practice is geared towards special operations. That's amazing. Yeah. So I'll review any kind of labs that have come in, any patient needs. I'm very, very much involved in their life. Yeah. A good physician, I believe, doesn't just diagnose illness, but also has a good perspective on the individual. Right. And by understanding the individual, there's relationships and it's just all very important. It's all holistic. Yeah. What would you say uh, in terms of your analysis and, and diagnosis of patients? Is it, is it all encompassing? Is for like, are you looking at, you know, lifestyle, nutrition, sleep, like Always. everything? Because it seems like most family practice uh, physicians don't really ask much of that. You know, it's like they, they, most of them don't know shit about nutrition they don't even ask you about, you know, how much sleep you're getting or, or, yeah. you know, they wouldn't even know if it's quality or not. But the other thing that I find for me kind of irritating is that most times going into, into most hospitals or clinics or, or most uh, doctors that you interact with for whatever reason, sickness wise, like I, I look at them and I'm like, dude, you're like, just looking at you, you're about the last motherfucker I would take advice from. You right. know, it's like, I look at you, you're a fucking mess. Like most doctors are, are a total mess. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're pasty and fat and out of shape and shitty posture. And it's just like, like, where is that disconnect? Yeah. I think that, well, number one, family practice is definitely you're triaging. You're coming in for high blood pressure. Uh, someone has a cough or a cold or wants their prostate check. No, just kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Better make it three fingers. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that 
the way in which the system is set up is is arguably a broken system. I'm fortunate that while I'm board certified in family practice, I don't practice family medicine as a concierge physician, which, you know, luckily I was able to do a fellowship. And when I was in there, I'm thinking, what am I doing here? Holy shit. How did yeah. I even land here? Yeah. Um, but the disconnect in terms of physician and execution is physicians are trained very algorithmic. Uh, you come in, you have high blood pressure, they know exactly how to treat it. But the more nuance of how do we take a whole person, how do we understand who they are, what they're working towards, what their goals are, are they actually even living in alignment? That, Believe it or not, the threshold for stress plays a level, plays a, a leveling of their health and wellness. Um, yeah, and in terms of why they are pasty, pale, and out of shape, are you trying to tell me something? Not you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, like it's to, to me that like that's pretty glaringly obvious. Like, you, I mean, there's some doctors that you see that's like, yeah, this guy or girl takes care of themselves, but most of them seem to not. You know, or or they're telling you things that it's like, are you listening to your own fucking advice? You know, like, uh, but I guess the I, I kind of diverted from my original question, which is you know, from, I mean, I already know the answer, but the, the kind of all encompassing approach that you take uh, is very different than most, yeah. most doctors. And then it, it, it seems like you look at the entire picture, which uh, really with all walks of life, that's a necessity to, to really understand what's going on is to look at, at every angle. Right. I mean, yeah. And I think it takes a lot to be trained up to do that. Yeah. When we think about experts in their fields, it takes a long time to gain expertise. As a physician, that takes a long time. To also then be an expert in nutrition also takes a long time. And I think that that's asking a lot of yeah. providers. Where it can really be helped is that if providers can recognize limitations and then outsource that to other experts in the field, yeah. I think that would be a way of creating a, a cohesive medical model. Yeah. No, I guess that's, that's for sure a fair point. It is asking a lot to, to be kind of a, a jack of all trades and master of all trades. You know, and maybe they almost. shouldn't be giving nutrition advice. Yeah. I, th I think maybe that's where the disconnect is, is that most people, uh, I, th I think societally we view doctors as almost godlike in their, in their knowledge base of, well, my doctor said, fill in the blank and it can be something that's way outside their wheelhouse. Maybe that's where, um, you know, putting their ego in their back pocket a little bit of saying, look, I, I don't have the answer for that. I don't know uh, about that. I'm going to refer you to this guy or, or whatever would be, would be, uh, maybe the solution to that. But yeah, because we have narratives that then become very difficult to get rid of yeah. the idea that you should stop eating eggs. I'll give you just one example because it increases someone's cholesterol. That's yeah. not true. Yeah. They took that out of the guidelines in 2015. Yeah. Dietary cholesterol. Uh, we know dietary cholesterol for the majority of people really make no impact on yeah. blood levels of cholesterol. Yeah. But every time a provider gives that piece of advice or recommendation to a patient, it stays with them. Yeah. And it, it definitely creates divides. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so when a, a patient comes in, what's like, I mean, it would take the whole episode for you to, to walk through kind of how, how you go through it, but what's kind of the, the reader's digest version of, of what you uh, ask slash look at and when, what the process looks like. What are your goals? I don't have any. <laughs> I'm perfect as I am. <laughs> no, I just, I know it's a lost cause. So, right. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the first goal and what's most valuable is what is important, important to the person. Yeah. Are we looking for optimization? Did you see the way your parents aged? Are you really looking to avoid that kind of aging? Do you feel like you lost the vigor that you did, that you had when you were in your thirties? Is it, you know, hormones, you want your hormones checked. Have you had a bunch of brain injuries? Do you have TBIs? I mean, it would be, what is this person looking to accomplish? Maybe they're fatigued, maybe their digestion is off. Maybe they're not building muscle like they used to. Yeah. The first step is really understanding who the person is, understanding their weaknesses, believe it or not, where they're going to fail. Because I can give an individual a great program, and if I know that they are not motivated or committed, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. I got to tell you, between uh, riding motorcycles, um, working out a fair bit, traveling on planes, 
I listen to a lot of music and other podcasts doing research for, uh, for this show. Um, and I just, uh, came on to Raycon wireless earbuds and I got to tell you, they are uh, a fraction of the price of some of the other big name brands, we'll call them. Uh, but they sound fantastic. Uh, they work great. Uh, the sound quality is amazing. Uh, and they stay in. Uh, more importantly for me, like taking my helmet on and off or doing lots of different exercises, I always have a, a hell of a time uh, keeping the earbuds in. And, and these stay in uh, phenomenally well. Uh, they've got eight hours of playtime. Uh, 32 hours of standby time, uh, and are just they're a phenomenal product. I mean, they feel well built. They charge fast. Uh, they're they're a fantastic product. I'm I'm real stoked to be working with them. Uh, and right now, if you go to uh, Raycon.com, that's R-A-Y-C-O-N.com, um, you can get 15% off if you use the code Mike Drop. So that's Raycon.com/slash Mike Drop for 15% off. And again, they're already. Uh, considerably more affordable to uh, some of the other brands out there. So uh, I listen to them and, and use them all the time. Fantastic quality. I can't recommend them enough. That's raycon.com forward slash mic drop for 15% off. What uh, what do you do? For, like for you, is there a, you got to meet me halfway or are you trying to motivate people also? You know, I, I would say that I'm lucky because the patients that come to see me are highly motivated. Yeah, They're motivated and driven for execution. That being said, they all really have to be aware of their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Humans are not without weaknesses. The biggest surprise people have is that they're surprised by their own human nature Yeah. when it comes to nutrition. If there's cake at home or they brought home cookies for their significant other and they're really trying hard to be on a great diet plan, they're shocked that they go off of it Yeah. after a stressful situation. Really being aware of weaknesses and yeah accounting for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so past, uh, so once you have their, their goals in mind from there, is it kind of an assessment phase next yes. or? Yeah. They will get a lot of blood work. Yeah. yeah. And are you checking everything? everything? Hormones, inflammatory markers, vitamins, minerals, cholesterol, cholesterol particles, everything. Yeah. And they're going to be very shocked by the amount of blood work. Yeah. And so from, how often do you do that? Depends on what they need. Yeah. Initially, if someone is healthy, you do it uh, once a year. But if someone is on some kind of hormone, then we'll check in very particularly dosed increments yeah. just to make sure safety is number one. The trick is, is can you push someone to an exceptional level of performance while keeping them safe? Yeah. And the way to do that is to monitor. Yeah. And that, so that like with uh, engines or, or equipment exactly. or, or anything else, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, is, is there a, a next phase or is it so dependent on what the blood work says that it's impossible to really say this is the next step? No, so blood work is only one part of what we do. Uh, there, you know, you can look at um, environmental exposures, which I think are very valuable. You can do early cancer screening, early cancer detection, which I think is also very important we do a lot of mold testing. Um, just there's a whole slew of other, a lot of digestive testing. A lot of people travel and eat sushi. Yeah. So if you do, don't eat it. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about that. I mean, is it just the obvious, like it's raw fish and who knows where the fuck it came from? A hundred percent. Yeah. And people struggle with digestive issues over a period of time. And the reality is you can do everything that you need to do. But if you still have some kind of bug, you got to get rid of it. Yeah. Is there a, a Just one? like chronic giardia with the dogs. Yeah. Lots of dogs get chronic giardia. Do you know that their handlers can get that too? Yeah. Uh, there's a, a number of things that are uh, transferable that way that a lot of people don't realize. But, and uh, that has to be tested and treated. Yeah. Is, is there a, uh, like a metronide is all one-stop shop the way <laughs> there is for dogs, for, for people? That, yes. For me, I do it for patients. Yeah. yeah. Is that what you use? I do. Yeah. It depends on, you know, I've seen hookworm, roundworm, liver fluke, schistomoniasis. Um, yeah. And, you know, for any of the, the team guys listening, typically one guy in the platoon will get infected yeah. and everybody gets it. Because they're all making out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And they all get it and yeah. they all need to be treated. One guy will have their gallbladder out, you know, deployment to Africa. They all get the same kind of bug. Yeah. And yeah. I will say... Not to interrupt you, I will say that the testing stateside is not as good as old school parasitology. And that's really? a huge problem that I see. What, uh, is there a, 
from your perspective, a reason for that? Because it's much easier to do what we call a PCR test. It's much easier to do a DNA test yeah. than it is for some guy in the back of the lab looking at slabs of shit. Yeah. <laughs> as fun as that is. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but it actually most, uh, many of the diagnoses are missed that way. Wow. And uh, with those like kind of off the wall worm or, or parasite uh, stomach bugs that can wreak havoc. Two, two questions, I guess. One, can can those go for years, years. With, without really knowing that you have it other than like, what would be some symptoms that? Not related to food. Number one, you feel like you've removed everything from your diet, but you still get really bad gas, bloating, weird diarrhea. Hate to throw anyone under the bus, but anal itching also, yeah. cyclical, <laughs> cyclical uh, yeah. A cyclical. Who are you throwing under the bus with that? <laughs> Whoever, <laughs> any of my patients, whatever. But um, any kind of itching, it could be skin itching, ears, anus, that's cyclical, right? Yeah. Every four to six weeks, weirdly, oddly pops up, um, yeah. things of that nature. And also, if individuals have low iron, they're always fatigued, they have low iron, and no one can figure out why. Yeah. In other countries, a hookworm infection or a worm infection is one of the number one causes. Wow. And we don't routinely test for this stuff. Yeah. Is, uh, in, in all of those cases, are you always prescribing metronidazole? I am. Yeah. Can you try to treat those things naturally? You can try. Yeah. Uh, because I do do a combination of natural treatment and medication in my practice. We'll always try to utilize natural modalities first. But worms and things of that nature are just difficult to treat. Yeah. Um, the I guess the second question I had was the... Uh, in that kind of um, same vein, is there um, a, a, like a typical uh, worm or bug that you see more often than not here in the United States that, that's undertreated or, or underdiagnosed? Yeah, I see a lot of hookworm really? and roundworm. Yes. And one of the things that you see in blood work is there's a, a, a blood marker, it's called the eosinophil. And typically those are above two, anywhere from two to four. And those individuals almost... Either they have allergies or they have worms. Yeah. Wow. And then in the in combination with low iron. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that from a digestion standpoint, like with any of those worm uh, infestations, um, from a digestion standpoint, does that throw like your gut bacteria and things like that way off? Or that's a great question. Not always. Yeah. One of the things that you'll see is they could be asymptomatic, meaning there's no symptoms of the worm other than they have a lot of nutrition, nu nutrient deficiencies yeah. because it does affect the, you know, it does affect your digestive tract, but it doesn't necessarily always affect the bacteria. Yeah. And they might, again, have low iron. They might have just low vitamin status. If, yeah. If, if that, uh, if any of those go untreated long enough, can, can that cause death? I mean. That's a good question. I've never seen that. Um, I would say in the U.S., unlikely. I, you know, I don't know in other countries, but depending on how bad something could be, uh, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Is, is there a, if it gets this bad, it's this glaringly obvious? Like what, is there a point at which, like if, if it's left untreated long enough where something will happen where it's pretty obvious that that's what the problem they is? They could see it. Really? Yeah. Jesus. They like, can see a major worm burden. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, man, that's why. Have you seen that in your practice at all? I've seen it once. Wow, that's crazy. Who yeah. was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there's, no, right. there's, no there's no I've one. seen it once, and yeah. it was frightening. Yeah, it's frightening. Man, that's that's crazy. What uh, can you? Is is there a HIPAA thing? Like without saying who it is, I mean, can um, you say what, it, like, was what it was a younger patient, and this patient had been eating a lot of sushi. Yeah, and just um, it looked like a earthworm. Wow. That's, that's what this individual's worms looked like. Damn, just that's crazy. Coming out. Yeah. Wow. Don't recommend that. So if anyone is listening who eats sushi, I highly recommend eating cooked fish, even if it's frozen. Really? Yeah. So you're, you're not a fan of sushi. Then. I used to be. Yeah. You I know, mean, would you say then, it's like prevalent? Yes. Really? Yes. And you also, you're not going to want to hear this. And you might throw me off the show. <laughs> so Probably. please don't. You might. Yeah. When dogs kiss you in the face, if yeah. they kiss you in the mouth, you can definitely get 
whatever worm they have if or any of that stuff this may or may not surprise you I actually don't let dogs lick my face but uh <laughs> i mean you have well, a lot of dogs so yeah, i mean I, not, well not i don't let them lick my mouth like once in a while one may like lick my ear or the side of my face or something or like the back of my head or like you know but never never in the like in but why because you you've, i just don't like it uh i mean for me it, well two things yeah. one I, like yeah I, I don't like it and two f for that same reason it's like you know that adage of dogs mouths are clean like they eat shit they eat fucking they dead animals clean? yeah i mean there's there's kind of a, an old wives tale of saying that like dogs mouths are cleaner than humans um but i, I don't buy it a and and two like i've seen a and two I've seen uh, I've seen them eat enough of their own shit or somebody else's shit exactly. or, or dead raccoons on the side of the road. Like, hard pass, hard yeah, pass. Yeah, I just I, I don't I don't need their fucking face in my face, you know. So that, that for like from a training standpoint too, kind of my blanket rule of thumb is don't stick your face in a in a, in a dog's face ever, uh, and I don't let them come to my face either. Like it's way way harder to get bit in the face accidentally or or mm -hmm. unknowingly if uh, if you never allow a dog to to put its face in up in your face but uh, so anyway but that's good good info for sure um all right so i've got a kind of a laundry list of of kind of hotbed topics that i want to talk about and by all means uh, if there's any you want to add throw it in there uh right before we get into that list though i would like to say Congrats on the show and, and just tell us a little bit yeah. about what uh, what that's going to be about. I'm hoping like, that you'll be on my show, uh, actually. Count on it. Bet your ass. <laughs> it's obviously called the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. And I apologize for that name, but I named it that so people could find it. Yeah. It is really about transparent conversations. I recently just this today had Remy Adeleke on. And it's just about uh, conversations that I think are incredibly valuable from the health and wellness space um, I do my best to make sure it's all vetted and evidence-based yeah. and I have experts in their perspective fields on their discussing. Yeah. Well, I've, I have no business coming on then. <laughs> uh, I would love to have you. I think it'd be yeah. a great conversation and it, it really is, um, for the listener and it is intended to provide value to their yeah. life. No, it sounds awesome. I, I would be honored to come on. So just let me know. Do you, uh, do most of them in person some and yes like, for you i don't think that you're planning on coming to new york so yeah. i would i'd be willing to do it remote but yeah. yes well if, if uh if ever i'm up that way i'll uh, i'll for sure come on in person do it remote it's okay yeah uh all right so in in the laundry list of things it's in no particular order just kind of off the cuff things that i uh, have either seen or read or heard about or thought about in the last couple of years since you've been on that i wanted to kind of uh, go over a little bit uh, seed oils there's a lot of, um, you know, I don't know, research or, or things coming out. Um, there seems to still be a lot of, I mean, fucking most products have seed oils of some sort in them. Uh, but there's at least some uh, stuff coming out talking about how bad they are for you. I'd like to kind of get your take on yeah. them. I think uh, seed oils, I think it's complex. I think there are many different types of seeds. I think there are many different ways in which it can be utilized I think at the end of the day, as long as your uh, good fats are in a ratio with the seed oil, I, I don't think it's a problem. And is that for all, like even like say cotton seed oil or, or any of those types? Yeah, I mean, I per se wouldn't necessarily be a fan of cotton seed oil. I, I would prefer things that, you know, seem to be more edible. But again, it really is the, the issue that people are talking about is inflammation. Yeah. And they're talking about a ratio between omega-3 and omega-6. And if your ratio is, you know, within a healthy range, I, I don't see a problem. Yeah. That also being said, you should be eating whole foods. Yeah. Seed oils are typically in packaged foods. Right. But we do have a population to feed. Yeah. But, well, yes, I mean, so on that, I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, folks out there that prescribe to, you have to eat this certain way or that, like to, to me that like, with the amount of people on the planet as is, and I know I'm going to catch shit for this. People are calling me Bill Gates talking about there's too many people on the planet. I'm not trying to fucking euthanize half the population. No, that's not what we're saying. But, but I also, you know, you know, I, I can understand that, you know, the planet has a certain infinite amount of resources and, and that has, has limitations. Um, uh, for those of people, I've also seen a lot of comments about like, no nah, man, the population is actually decreasing. It's like, the population's fucking doubled since I was a kid. I don't, I don't know on what fucking planet you can, you can call that it's as a being flat a flat one. Uh, yeah, a, yeah, no shit. Um, but 
um, you know, to, to, for the entire population to eat any one singular way, I think doesn't work. Right. I mean, like I if that. everybody ate all, all meat or mostly meat, like there wouldn't be enough meat. If everybody ate all, all plants or vegan based there, there wouldn't be enough to supply that either. So, I mean, uh, that's where I think, you know, the different types of, of diets in conjunction with, um, you know, di different people have different requirements and, and what, is optimal for them plays a huge role and, and you know it seems like trying to find that happy medium is is the key i want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast which is bubs naturals uh the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to glenn doherty his nickname was bub uh, i did two platoons with him and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bubs Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bubs or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bubs brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So, uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, it mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint, from a joint support, gut support. Um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as as we age, uh, that are integral components to uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and uh, be able to to work with them and, and sponsor a product that uh, number one is a high quality product and number two is is so near and dear to uh, you know to my heart and to the Mike Drop podcast for for who it uh, was started for and what it stands for um, you know is just uh, it's an amazing amazing place to be so um, it is Whole Thirty approved. Um, it's uh, sport certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that um, you know right now they're they're offering twenty percent twenty percent off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and uh, use the mic drop code. So uh, I really highly encourage you to to try it out, incorporate it into your day day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health. And, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in Glenn Bubb's honor. So uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code 20% off. From a diet standpoint, whether it's keto, vegan, zone, paleo, carnivore, eat right for your blood type, all, all of those different types of things, if you could just kind of give uh, your updated perspective on, on all of that. I think you bring up something really, really important. People, the planet wouldn't necessarily be able to support one if we all ate the same way. Yeah. And I actually have never thought about that. And I also hadn't thought about as we are having these conversations and we are trying to educate people, we are essentially saying that yeah. as all these people are arguing. The idea that we eat locally and what is available to the person in that local environment, I think would be very beneficial, especially if people are concerned about the environment, transportation affects the environment negatively. Also the localness of the food, for example, the nutrients get depleted over a period of time. If you are eating, if you are getting an avocado from Mexico and shipping it to Minnesota, by the time it gets to Minnesota, it's probably not much of an avocado. Yeah. Eating locally, I think, is really important. I do think there are certain principles that are very valuable, which is prioritizing dietary protein, especially now more than ever. Protein, you know, in the guidelines, protein hasn't been updated in the last 30 years. 30 years? You mean to tell me we haven't come up with any new science about protein in the last 30 years? That's simply not true. 
I believe that prioritizing dietary protein is what the evidence supports. We will eventually see a changeover in the guidelines. Whether you are plant-based, whether you are carnivore, keto, whatever that you choose, you still have to prioritize protein. Yeah. And you need more of it as you age. Not that you and I are aging, but if we were <laughs> to consider that, yeah. we need that. Well, so, you know, I think where, where it can be confusing uh, for anybody um, is to see, like, there's such a, a fire hose of, of information out there and, and, you know, people in every camp that are screaming that, you know, everything, I mean, it's almost like religion. I mean, fuck, it's not almost, I mean, it is like there are people that, that are more passionate about how they eat than they are about any religious belief system that they may or may not have. So for somebody that is, we'll say just starting out or, or naive to all of it, what would be your recommendation to figure out what is the best fit for them uh, as far as you know their body and, and their needs their goals and, and how to how to navigate the circus that that exists out there yeah number one choose whole foods it's very difficult to overeat chicken breast it's very difficult to overeat apples or berries right or asparagus choosing whole foods getting good quality protein and i don't actually care if it's organic or conventionally raised I think that whether you're eating beef, bison, chicken, fish, you should prioritize protein, eggs, dairy, and then really understanding that you have to get a sense of how many calories you're ingesting. There's no two ways about it. Uh, you have to understand what you're ingesting if you really want to make changes. Yeah. But again, if someone is just looking for baseline information, what should they do? I think common sense plays a, a great role role here. Eat whole foods, prioritize protein. Don't eat a bunch of breads and pastas. Don't drink a lot. Get sleep. Yeah. Hydrate. As, as far as the uh, kind of the, the seems like the most hotbed or uh, divisive topic out there is the prioritizing protein and, and where that comes from. Um, you know, and, and so that's the, you know, the, the thing that it seems like people seem to get the most stuck on or argue the most about what do you have a, a thought process or how, how do you approach it? Like if you get a client that's like, Hey, I'm hell bent on, on this. Uh, are you trying to sway them to a certain direction or are you saying, okay, well, here's your goals here. Here's the analysis of, of what your body looks like via your blood. And that's telling me what's going on. And this is what I recommend. Is that kind of how you go about it? Or the first, the first thing that I want to know is, uh, curiosity. I'm curious. If they come into me, if they come to me and they say they want to be plant-based, why? If that ends up being a topic of conversation, if it's ethical, then um, I would do my best to create a solution for them. But if it's for health reasons, I think that we have to have a different conversation. This whole animal plant divide. So I've been in nutrition 20 years. This 10 years ago, this was not what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. This division between animal and plant groups, it was much more subtle. Now we're moving to this, quote, great reset. And Frederick Leroy talks a lot about this. He's a professor. He's a PhD. He talks a lot about this great reset. And at the end of the day, we have to understand who stands to profit. Because it's very confusing for this av the average consumer does it make sense that we would eliminate an entire food group? No. no. Does it make sense that humans for millions of years have been eating animal-based products now all of a sudden stop? None of that makes sense. From a nutrient density perspective, bioavailable zinc, iron, calcium, you know, what's happening is we are getting to the younger generation and we are creating a narrative that is not about food. It's really about emotion. Emotion. It's um, like a badge of honor. I'm only plant-based. And this is not to say being plant-based is bad. You know, I don't want to offend everybody. <laughs> just most people. Just most people. <laughs> I think that we just have to have really transparent conversations. And if we really care about the health of people, then I think a more balanced approach makes a lot of sense. But unfortunately, we have news media and we have influencers in the space that I believe are wanting to do a good job, but 
are somewhat brainwashed. And the unintended consequences of what is happening, the repercussions are going to be great. Yeah. They're going to be great. We shouldn't all go vegan. Being plant-based is not necessarily better for the planet. It's a very um, tunnel vision type of view. We need dietary protein. Can you get the same amount of protein from an animal that you could get with a plant? Yeah, you'd have to eat like six cups of quinoa and a million cups of beans and get a lot of carbohydrates. And most people can't tolerate that. That would create metabolic dysregulation, meaning that would create insulin resistance, that would create obesity. It's very difficult. I'd like to see you go plant-based for a day. I would not like to see me go plant-based <laughs> for a day. Could you do it? You could do it. No, I, I but mean, your carbohydrate intake, and yeah. also from a logical perspective, does that you know, thing of broccoli look like that piece of steak? Yeah. Do they both have amino acids in it? Yeah. They're clearly two different substances. Yeah. Here's what I would say for like anybody who's been listening more than, than 10 minutes, uh, you it know, hasn't to, turned me off to, yet. to my show. Well, no, I just mean that I guess to my show collectively <laughs> or, or chronologically knows that, that I'm a huge meat eater. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm carnivore. I mean, I eat plenty of, of vegetables and, and fruit as well, but, uh, but I'm definitely a, a meat eater at heart. I always have been and, and probably always will be. I, I joke about not trying vegan for a day. What I would say is, excuse me, for the sake of experiment and to talk about it on the show, like I would be willing to do an experiment un under close supervision of somebody who really has a grasp on plant-based nutrition. Like I would be willing to try it for a short period of time, whether it's a day, a week. I don't know that I would do 30 days of it, but you know, I would try it for, you know, wh whatever enough time is to say like, yeah, I, I actually tried it and here's, here's how I felt or whatever. I, I don't agree with uh, with that, but again, just for the sake of of saying, you know, hey, I'll, I'll try it. If here's the big if is that if there's somebody out there that's willing to to try the other the other way too, right? Is that I'll I'll tit for tat that way. Uh, and so, it can be done, by the way. It can be done, and there are parts to removing certain amino acids. And I don't want to go too deep in the weeds. That actually upregulates your body's responses to things. It's, it's this, it's called the integrative stress response. And really what that does is it allows your body to meet the needs of some new pathway, yeah. right? And so there, there can be benefit for periods of time if someone were to restrict animal based products, but it should be done specific. It shouldn't necessarily be done as a way of life yeah. because you have to maintain that muscle tissue as you age. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. I mean, and as you age, you typically eat less. Yeah. And also, how are you going to get creatine and all these other uh, components of the food matrix? And I mean, my my take on uh, supplementation is, is is that it is just that it's it's supplementation. It shouldn't be the basis. Like for a lot of people, it's like, well, I can take creatine in, in powder form. I can take pills for this or, or that, or you know, supplement these vitamins, minerals. To me, like, I'm curious. I mean, you work with plenty of supplement companies. It stands to reason, just like if whole foods are better than packaged, that nutrients from any whole food is going to be better than in powder or liquid or supplementation form. I think the first line of defense is to get a whole food diet. The soil isn't what it used to be. It's very difficult to get the amount of omegas that we need, omega-3s that we need. You know, even vitamin D, there's certain supplementation I think is very valuable. Yeah. That in conjunction with a nutrient dense diet. Yeah. Okay. Um, on your website or in your practice or, or just anywhere, I guess, do you have like a, a list of here are the supplements that I like and recommend? Like, do you have to be a patient of yours to get it? Sh I should do that. I would be happy to do that. That's a great idea. I do yeah. have a free protocol on my website. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, cause to me that that's, I think one of the big problems for myself and in, included is that there's so much shit out there uh, that it's like right. uh, how do you even know what to pick i mean without somebody who you really trust helping you navigate through i mean there's pick a vitamin right there's two thousand purveyors of, of supplementation for that vitamin you know so it's like well i don't i don't even know which which one to go off of other than using the amazon star system which uh, is flawed that. No, no, <laughs> so no. people uh, can go to my website they can check out um so i work with first form it's a great company uh they very much are in line with my values and I am certain yours. Yeah. Okay. They make great products. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I've heard nothing but good things about them, but uh, no, it's good, uh, good to know. You know, I would offer you some uh, good rancher's beef, but uh, I actually ate it all. Uh, maybe next time that you're in town, we can uh, break bread over that. It's a company that I just started working with. They sent me a box of, uh, of their beef with a number of different cuts. And I got to tell you, like, I'm, I'm picky. Uh, who doesn't love shoving a bunch of meat in their mouth? Uh, I know I sure do, but the quality of it is, uh, is remarkable. I was really, really impressed with uh, the 21-day aging process that they do. Uh, you know, the, the flavor is impeccable. Uh, it's super tender meat. And for me, like it, it's really convenient to just have it shipped. Like I'll pop it out, uh, you know, let it thaw for an hour or two after a workout or whatever, and throw it in a, in an air fryer, uh, or on a, a top down grill and, and, you know, it's ready in a matter of minutes, but it's, uh, it's predictable and it's, it's always good. Uh, and I'm really blown away by the quality of it. Uh, you know, I've ordered meat from pretty much every purveyor out there. Uh, some which is like, uh, you know, at the, at the top level of, of expense in terms of, uh, you know, what they consider quality. And uh, I got to tell you, Good Ranchers is the go-to uh, company for me now. So uh, what I also love is that they, they're doing this program where um, they're actually giving back 100,000 meals to kids in need. Uh, you know, so they, they kind of walk the walk and talk the talk. And I, I think a company that gives back, uh, you know, to society and, and to especially kids in uh, in need that are hungry is, uh, is a pretty admirable quality. Um, I also love the fact that they're offering uh, $30 off and free shipping. If you go to goodranchers.com and do uh, mic drop as the, uh, the code um, it's all, all American beef. They don't source their beef from, from anywhere outside the country. It's all local farms. So you're, you're supporting local farms by getting it. Uh, and again, it's just a really, really high quality beef. So uh, love the company, good ranchers, go to goodranchers.com. Uh, and use the code mic drop for 30 bucks off and free shipping. You, you spoke a little bit on inflammation and the omega balance. I'm curious, inflammation is another one of those kind of things that in the last, uh, you know, five years or so, 10 years maybe has kind of been, been brought up more and more often. Um, what, what are some general truths about it and some big uh, misinformation pieces? Yeah. On it? I think that the idea that all inflammation is bad is incorrect. You can get inflammation from training. You can get inflammation from any kind of stress response. The body is designed to adapt and meet the call of duty or whatever. Where inflammation is a problem, and inflammation is a blanket term for a lot of different things. It could be a dysregulation of your immune system. You could pull you know, a hangnail back and you'll get inflammation, right? You'll get cells to the, the location and you'll get red and hot, whatever. That is also considered inflammation. You have inflammation in arteries and blood vessels, all of which you know, can contribute to cardiovascular disease. Acute inflammation is not bad. Something that happens and goes away. Whether you run, um, whether you do some kind of activity that generates inflammation, and then it, it calms back down. Chronic inflammation over a long period of time is where you have issues. And that can be seen in blood work. There's one blood marker like a HSCRP, and it's a C-reactive protein that comes from the liver. Chronic inflammation over periods of time changes the way in which your body responds, changes the physiology, yeah. and that's a problem. And what, what are the, uh, the biggest uh, generators of chronic inflammation? Obesity, being overweight, overconsumption of food is the biggest cause of chronic of, in my opinion, of chronic inflammation. Is there a, a biggest culprit nutritionally outside of excess consumption? Is there an ingredient or a class of food that is the most notorious for? Highly palatable foods. <clears throat> I saw those Twinkies in your cupboard. You're lying. <laughs> I am lying. I'm totally lying. <laughs> now, Pringles, there are some Pringles. <laughs> I know. I saw that too. I wasn't sure if I was going to call you out. They're not mine. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, well, I mean, um, not really. Highly processed palatable foods. I think that that creates a lot of issue. And in addition, you know, trans fats are not good, but just really crappy overconsumption of processed foods because it's easy to eat. Yeah. Could you have it in your diet? 80% of your diet is clean and then you're sneaking Pringles under your desk? Totally. I'm not sneaking them. <laughs> I'm, I'm eating them wide open. Yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely. But this, you know, People fail to recognize that this, there's this term called insulin resistance, yeah. which is, you know, the pancreas is a hormone peptide 
that makes the pancreas makes a hormone peptide called insulin. Insulin glucose, which is sugar, is toxic to all cells. You need it, but it's toxic. And this creates a ton of issues when you are over consuming glucose. Insulin resistance leads to a whole host of problems like diabetes. That actually starts in muscle, starts in skeletal muscle. So if I were to say what is the biggest contributor to obesity, I would say having unhealthy skeletal muscle and overconsumption of crappy food. Yeah. At the highly palatable foods, meaning foods that are combined with carbohydrates and fats, like fried chicken or cake or cookies, things that are high carbohydrate, high sugar, even though chicken nuggets aren't high sugar. I know because we may or may not eat them. Occasionally. Occasionally. You ate McDonald's on the way to the- I was pregnant I know, and <laughs> so nauseous. <laughs> I know, I'm talking with you. <laughs> I Last remember. time I was here, I, I don't even know how pregnant I was, but I had hyperemesis gravidum, yeah. which is you vomit for 10 months. Yeah. It was terrible. Oh, I remember. I, I, uh, I was, you're like, you'll never see me do this again, but yeah. And then a year, and then 10 months later. Yeah. Irish twins, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're really so, cute. No, I, I can't wait to meet them. Uh, you want to know their names? I don't think I told you. You know. Well, they're, uh, they're very Viking-esque names. Leonidas, yeah. Michael, and Aries Hunter. Oh, it's fucking great. I love it. Um, if anyone wants me to name their children out there, yeah. I'm totally happy to do it. <laughs> you, you charge a small <laughs> fee. I actually saw saw that there was like some high end uh, baby naming service, like ten grand a, a pop or some stupid shit. That's like you got so much money that you're just trying to find reasons <laughs> to brag about what you spend your money on, I guess. But um, so, am, am I correct in assuming then that that it's more kind of eating principles than it is targeting a specific food group of saying? This is what's causing inflammation. Absolutely. Me meaning it's the overconsumption of this. It's not this product or this ingredient. It's. Absolutely. The question that we would have to ask is what is the mechanism of action? If you eat this one Twinkie, are you going to have chronic inflammation? No. It is. Uh, I think when we try to really say that one food is responsible for all things. And this really pertains to whole foods when they say meat is responsible for cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke. It is actually the way in which they would portray, say something like meat, that's more impactful than smoking. You yeah. mean to tell me that eating a steak is, is, is bad for your health in the same way smoking is? No. Yeah. That's also to say on the flip side of that is eating, I don't know, a, a, a small thing of Pringles going to be the demise of you as a human? Probably not. I think over a period of time, we have to understand that the human body, God willing, we live for a long time. Yeah. And it is not one thing that creates inflammation, but if you live in a state where you have excess body fat and unhealthy muscle, now you're in for trouble. What, uh, when you say unhealthy muscle, is that just a lack of it or? What kind of steak do you have last night? I didn't have steak last night. What about actually. the night before? Um, like, what do you mean? What kind? Like what cut or? Yeah, I was, I was, I was trying to. Um, Actually, no, you know what? I, I had uh, good, good ranchers hamburger patties, which is a sponsor of the show now. <laughs> so uh, they actually have really, really good food, uh, really great beef. I order beef uh, from everywhere. Like I've ordered beef. I mean, you name it. I've, I've ordered you had it. certified Piedmontese. No, I'm going to have some sent to you. Yeah. I'm going to have some sent to you. Anyway, I was getting at that because a marbled ribeye. Yeah. That's all. That's all meat. When fat infiltrates muscle, that muscle is less healthy. That's what happens to us as humans. Mm -hmm. We don't just have nice red, healthy muscle. We get fat all up in there. Yeah, <laughs> all up in there. So, so is that a recommendation to eat leaner meat then? It can be, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because it allows you to keep your calories in check. I, I was just writing this, this section for my book. Yeah. And there's a huge push towards high fat diets. I think, it's, I think it can be a problem. Yeah. I think we have to be able to prioritize dietary protein when it comes to dietary fat, overconsumption of fat's an issue. Also, why are you going to do it? Get your calories from lean sources of protein. Yeah. Much better strategy. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, so I guess back, back to the question then, that what, what does unhealthy muscle tissue, is that what you mean? Is it yeah, it's when you have unhealthy muscle tissue, you're less able to manage glucose. I got gotcha. you. You're less able to manage the, you know, muscle is responsible for the majority of glucose disposal. 
Yeah. So those Twinkies that you were hiding when you eat those Twinkies, the muscle is largely responsible yeah. for that. And okay. of course, exercise can help with the disposal of everything. Yeah. But if you want to keep inflammation low, you need to have healthy skeletal muscle. Yeah. Do you know exercise? So are you ready for this? I'm ready. Are you ready? To I'm ready. Your mind? Okay. Muscle is an endocrine organ. Really? You're like what's that? You know, it's an organ like the thyroid is an organ. When you contract it, it secretes myokines. These are proteins from the muscle. When you contract it, when you're doing your bicep curl, they go throughout the body. They actually interface with the immune system. Hmm. Skeletal muscle plays a role in immune system interface. So what that means is overall, it can lower inflammation. You know that big cytokine storm that people always talk about? Skeletal muscle, when you contract it, when you have healthy skeletal muscle, can play a role in dampening that response. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so the the biggest culprit then is is basically just shitty uh, quality of food. And domestication of our planet. And too much, yeah, okay. Um, in the same vein as protein, um, talking about getting lean, lean sources of protein, you know, a big... Uh, I wouldn't say push, but just a very popular mechanism for uh, getting enough protein or extra protein is through protein powder, through bars, through uh, things like that. I mean, I, I'm always of the opinion that that's never as good as real food, uh, which it sounds like you are too. But um, is there a recommendation, a, a happy medium? Uh, and again, like, are there certain products that you would say, yeah, if you're, if you're going to like try to eat a steak or a chicken breast or a whatever, but if you if you have to use powder or bars, use use these kinds. Is is there a direction you have that way? Whey protein is actually a, a I consider whey a food matrix. I don't consider whey this processed food. I mean, it, it it does have processing, but it has these immunoglobulins in it. It's not just protein. It has a whole slew of amino acids. The ideal ratio of amino acids. Whey protein is probably one of the best food sources. One of the best protein sources. So co comparatively to say soy protein isolate. Yeah, I mean, it has a lot of isoflavonoids. Doesn't necessarily so whey protein exists in nature. Whey exists in nature. Pea protein. If you're vegan or vegetarian, you can choose soy or pea. But the long term. You know, I think we have to ask, are there going to be long-term issues with that? Pea protein doesn't exist in nature. A majority of the pea protein, we know what's in it, meaning we know it has pea proteins, but what about all the other um, plant-containing materials? We don't know. I mean, pea does have estrogen-like activity. So that's, uh, you know, one of the, I'd say, more hotbed arguments people get into. You've got you know, people against it saying that, you know, soy increases estrogen, especially in men. Uh, there's, you know, the other side of the token says, no, it doesn't. What, you know, what do you see that, I guess, from a blood? Yeah, I don't have many men eating soy protein. Yeah, I, I will. Strangely <laughs> enough. Strangely enough, in my practice, I, I typically don't see men having soy protein. Do I think, I, I think when one would ask, does it actually increase estrogen? You would have to determine Number one, how much are they ingesting? I, I haven't seen that to be the case. That also being said, choosing a whey-based protein shake would be better. If they don't do well on whey, there's animal-based products that have, um, you know, like egg white proteins and all kinds of other things. And then if someone is really, really keen on being plant-based, then a, a rice pea blend. Yeah. But again, over the long term, do we know what the the P isolates are going to do, we don't. Yeah. And so it's not so much that you're saying necessarily they're bad. It's, it's saying that, that you just don't know. Like there's we no, don't know. Yeah. And then I would say question, why are you doing this? Yeah. For, for the people that say it's purely out of health and not ethical, you'd That's say that not there, true. there's not enough. That's not true. Yeah. Okay. Um, and they have to be really, really careful on that because the wave of youth only lasts so long. Yeah. And when you're young and dumb, you can be hard. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But as you get older and hormones change and you need more sleep and your calorie consumption is down and your physical activity is down and you are faced with changing muscle, we've all seen our parents age. Yeah. The, the tissue changes. They become more, more sarcopenic. Gravity takes be, hold. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Sorry, mom and dad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you have to be much more particular yeah. about what you're consuming. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, youth uh, lends a certain flexibility nutritionally totally. that, that uh, I think is misleading. But I'm 29. Yeah, <laughs> well, you look 29. <laughs> I want to take a minute to talk about uh, sleep and recovery, which, uh, as we all know, I've had a number of guests on that speak to the importance, and I, I know I can certainly uh, attest to how important good sleep is, which is why I love GhostBed. Uh, every mattress has a 20-year warranty. Uh, some even have a 25 you can try it out for 101 nights if you don't like it. You can send it back. No hard feelings. Um, one of the favorite, one of my favorite parts about GhostBed is that it has a, a cooling technology in it, which uh, I can tell you from here in Texas in the summer times is crucial uh, to not sweating your ass off at night. And so, uh, the cooling technology, in conjunction with the warranty uh, and the level of comfort, uh, really provide a one-stop shop for. Um, you know, just a, a great night's sleep and, uh, and a recoverful, uh, restful sleep. Uh, GhostBed also offers bundles so that you can get um, really everything you need. Uh, you can choose from their four mattresses and then pick the bundle. So whether you just need a mattress and a frame or you want the whole package, like the cooling pillows and sheets, uh, you can get the best bang for your buck that way. Uh, right now, GhostBed is offering 40% off the ghost bed bundles where you get a mattress and adjustable base. That's 40% off or 30% off everything. If you use the code mic drop, all caps, all one word at ghostbed.com forward slash mic drop. Uh, you can buy a mattress for uh, like 35 bucks a month. They have 0% financing, zero down plans for up to 60 months. Uh, again, go check out ghostbed.com forward slash mic drop, all caps, all one word. Um, also, uh, if you do have an RV or a camper, uh, be sure to check out the GhostBed RV mattress. You can get uh, all foam or hybrid versions, and it's perfectly sized to fit an RV, camper, trailer, etc. And it's way better than what you're sleeping on now with uh, any of the other aftermarket stuff out there or damn sure what is included from whatever RV manufacturer you got it from. Uh, and again, you can get 30% uh, off the RV mattress by using the code mic drop. So one last time, that's ghostbed.com forward slash mic drop. Uh, and that code again is mic drop, all capitals, all one word. The, uh, all right. So here's, here's the problem that I run into with, uh, I, like I said, I always prefer real food, but for shakes, for powders, uh, bars, whatever is that, uh, and, and I agree, like I, I typically look for uh, whey based everything, um, or animal based, but there's always some sort of artificial sweetener, almost always. I'm fine with it, believe it or not. Really? Mm -hmm. Like uh, even aspartame? I mean, I just haven't seen enough evidence. I mean, I don't eat it routinely. But again, the dose creates a poison. And I think if you're eating mostly whole foods and there happens to be something with aspartame, it's okay. As long as you're not, your entire diet consists of yeah. aspartame, sweetened everything. And maybe you choose monk fruit. Yeah. Great. Is there a, a prioritized list of if you're going to have an artificial sweetener, it would be this first? Definitely don't have the saccharin. And I think saccharin is still out there. I definitely don't recommend saccharin. That's the little pink, yeah. the pink tabs. Sweet and low. Uh, yeah. Don't, don't, don't have that. I prefer monk fruit or stevia. I, I actually don't use sweeteners at all. I, I don't eat a lot of sweet type things. Well, you and I are very different that way because <laughs> I have a sweet tooth that'll slap I do somebody. not. I, I absolutely do not. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, and then bars. Wait, they're, they're, I wanted to mention bars. Cold pressed par cold pressed bars are great um, when things are not heated to super high temperatures. Was, do you have an example of cold pressed? I mean, so um, First Form makes a great cold pressed bar. The I also eat a lot of these Epic bars. Yeah, but that's processed meat. But I love them. Yeah, I eat the shit out of those. <laughs> you do too. Yeah, and then there's another company called. Have you had a, ever had a Carnivore Crisp? Mm -mm. Oh no, yeah, I have. I've had Liver Crisp. Uh, that's from no. There. I definitely uh, hard pass on that. Yeah. No offense, yeah. but I don't like them. I, I I liver is so hard for me to eat. Yeah, same here. Ca encapsulate that. Yeah. But Carnivore Crisp, they have. We travel with it a lot. Ribeye and brisket, and oh, the really? kids love it. Yep. I, I'll, I'll and it's a that. way to have whole foods. Yeah. And it's just, uh, it's kind of like biltong where it's just dehydrated. Yeah. yeah. It's different. It's, it's different. Yeah. We use biltong too. Yeah. Uh, men versus women in terms of diet, you know, dietary restrictions, um, exercise, et cetera. What, like what's kind of the broad spectrum? Um, complex men typically, um, 
have more flexibility in terms of food because they are bigger and have more testosterone. Stronger, bigger, no offense, ladies. It's, it's just true. The interesting aspect is around the time when hormones shift. So during andropause, which is not a real diagnosis, right? <laughs> Women go through menopause, they lose their female hormones. Men go through andropause or they get their man period, however you want to you, you want to say it, during the times of low hormones, individuals tend to put on body fat. And during those times, you really have to tighten up training. During those times, obviously, resistance exercise is very important. But I will say high-intensity uh, high interval training done correctly is incredibly valuable. And that would be, you know, 90% effort, 20, 30 seconds, and then rest. Yeah. And do it for 20 minutes. How, how much rest if you're doing 90 seconds of? Now, people will argue and say it should be a full recovery so that you can do it again. Uh, it depends you. on your level of training. Yeah. Okay. So for me, it's about an hour <laughs> in between those 90 seconds. Um, but the one thing that is the same on the same for both men and women is dietary protein. Dietary protein is based on body weight, not sex. And are you the gram gram and a quarter per pound lean one body. gram per pound ideal body weight make it easy for both men and women yeah um and so how like are, are you doing like the in like the diagnostic in I body do. type mm -hmm. stuff that tells you so this is how many grams of protein you need i do the in body to see how much muscle mass someone has how much body fat somebody has how much visceral fat so yeah. visceral fat is the fat around the organs the belly fat and in terms of dosing protein, you start for everybody one gram per pound ideal body weight. Yeah. Okay. Um, for that visceral fat thing, I mean, that's probably, would you say that that's the most dangerous? Of course. And, and what, uh, how is that measured? Like DEXA, you can do it. DEXA also an in body does it. And so, is, I mean, is it on a scale of something to something or what? So on an in body, it's a scale one to 10. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what's uh mine is one. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, what, uh, is there a, yours it, is probably one too. It, it needs to be less than on an in body scale. You know, it should be, you know, the lower, technically the lower, the better. Yeah. You don't want visceral fat. You can see it on an MRI as well, but that's not necessarily practical. Everyone would argue. Most people would argue the lower, the better. Yeah. Okay. You is, don't want it. It's there, inflammatory. You know, we talked about inflammation yeah. that creates chronic inflammation. Yeah. These fat is not just an innate structure. Right, it, it can generate inflammatory adipokines, which are uh, proteins from fat. Yeah. Okay. Is there a, is there a you you know a break not a break even but like a at a minimum like this is the most that you should recommend? I mean, I know the the lower the better, but um, that's a good question. I would say it it tracks with body fat potentially. Um, you know, you and I honestly would say the lower the better. Is there a percentage, uh, I mean, there, there's a percentage where, it w which it's dangerously low, right? I mean, yeah. And most people don't really get there. Yeah. Uh, but again, you're not really supposed to have a ton of visceral fat. It can track with body fat, but it's not necessarily linear all the time, right? So if you're 30% body fat, depending on where you carry it, you'll have visceral fat. But again, there's a healthy amount of body fat. And then with the visceral fat, again, that's the fat that covers the organs, that is, people will o almost always say the lower the better. Yeah. Because it's not body fat percentage, it's visceral fat. So yeah. body fat percentage, you know, healthy body fat percentage could be anywhere if you're a female from, you know, I, I think 12 is fine, which is really, really low. 12 to 20%, no problem. Yeah. In terms of visceral fat, though, you don't need, you know, visceral fat. Yeah. And uh, men. High amounts of visceral fat. Men percentage wise, do you say a little lower than that? Yeah, so men can be, again, it depends on the body size, the body phenotype, but it could be 10% for men. Yeah. And that's low. That's very low, 15%. Yeah, okay. Um, you, you, but I will say yeah. that when people talk about the, the higher ends of, quote, normal, I think it's too high. Yeah. Right? 25% body fat's probably too high. Right. For either. Yeah. Yeah. Especially men, though. It sounds like men typically should be yeah. a little lower. Yeah. Even 20%, even though we call that as normal, we would say that that's normal, we have to think, what are the standards that we're putting ourselves against? Yeah. Especially when you, like, when you look at pictures from like 50, 60, 70 years, like World War II era, 
like nobody was fat. Do you know like the average nobody. weight of a, a male back then? Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say 165 maybe. I don't know. About uh, about 100, I, I think it's about between 140 and 150 pounds. Wow. Now it's got to be close to 200 or above probably. And the average woman was, I think, maybe one, I, I can't remember. I think she was 120, yeah. 110 to 120. Yeah, wow. I mean, you can see it in pictures, right? I mean, like even yeah. like military to military, if you see – you know, this, this crew on this ship in yeah. 1945 and look at a crew on this ship in 2022, like it's not the same, like it, it's fucking crazy. Yeah. And I think that's where we really have to get the recommendations right because it actually affects the military. Yeah. The dietary guidelines, the governmental agencies that impart these recommendations, it affects children in schools, the military, and also government programs like WIC. Yeah. Yeah, and then having shitty, uh, shitty uh, foods brought brought into those programs. Um, you uh, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but age related diet and exercise. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed as I've gotten older, like the exercise, um, like like for me, it seems counter uh, productive to to work out the way I did when I was twenty in terms of joint health and and injury and, and things like that. But what do you have? Kind of a broad spectrum. Uh, guideline on uh, on that as you get older that these are the things to shift towards or, or what do you think i think we should clarify you working out in your 20s was you were probably a maniac yeah but <laughs> maybe so yes I, I think that we should restructure that as people age definitely maintaining skeletal muscle mass is hands down the most important do you know if someone falls and breaks a hip, which is extremely, extremely dangerous and unfortunately common, anyone over the age of 65, if a woman falls and breaks her hip, there is a high likelihood she will never walk again unassisted. I didn't know that. Jeez. Not saying that you're 65, not yeah. saying the listener is 65, but if yeah. you are, resistance training starting now will take you through those years. Yeah. Understanding resistance training is key. That could be three to four days a week at least, and also programming so you're evolving it's not just this thing that you do kind of half ass going to do bicep curls but actually getting with someone and programming and also doing zone two cardio training which is that steady state training zone two steady state training very valuable for cardiovascular health i will also say and this is somewhat controversial again adding in a day or two of high intensity interval training is really important. You don't need to necessarily be lifting super heavy, as you had mentioned, in terms of your joints, but you do need to go to a perceived exertion. You do need to really stress those muscles. Yeah. And uh, and that's how many days a week are you saying? Two days a week? To high intensity? Yeah. High intensity would be one to two days. Sure. Yeah. Again, it depends on, do you have body fat to lose? Yeah. It's extremely effective for improving insulin sensitivity and body fat. Yeah. Um, and then again, and then resistance exercise, it should be a way of life. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the recovery aspect of that, uh, salt intake, that's another thing yeah. that I think gets criminalized, uh, both unnecessarily and dangerously. So is, is the role that salt plays. Uh, but from a recovery standpoint, um, can you talk a little bit about that, whether it's, um, you know, salt hydrate rehydration, uh, like the the zero gravity floating, the ice baths, the right. red light therapy, um, the ice bath thing. I'm gonna say it like I'm tired of seeing people get into fucking tubs of ice. Like <laughs> every swinging dick out there has a video of themselves doing it, and it's like I, I get it. Yeah. Like I you, think you people have, into a cold have survived tub of ice. a long period of time without doing ice baths. Yeah. Can they be beneficial? Sure. Red light therapy, I love. Uh, these are all tools. None of these tools matter if your foundational home is not in place. You got to do the foundation stuff first before any of that stuff really matters. In terms of um, recovery, sleep is going to be your biggest asset. And also getting tested for sleep apnea. Every single athlete and nearly every SEAL I have in my practice has sleep apnea. Really? Uh huh. So I've recently come across a fair bit of research uh, that's, that's pretty fascinating that has, a, has an enormous correlation between um, spine alignment, <clears throat> posture, um, palate development, uh, tongue placement, mewing, et cetera, and how, how enormous of a role that plays both in, in childhood especially, but even as adults in 
using certain devices to, to lay on and, and to align your spine properly to, to allow your airway to, to open up and, and your tongue position playing arguably the biggest role. Have you seen any of that recently? Yeah. Uh, I don't know so much about the spine alignment, but definitely tongue position, thrusting, and oral PT are very valuable. Yeah. And a lot of times kids get a tongue tie. They're mm. born with tongue tie or they even have cheek tie. And why this matters is just the way in which the tissue is. Why this matters is it, be, it can affect your breathing and airway. Yeah. And kids that they think have ADHD actually are either not getting enough sleep or not getting enough um, air in terms of breathing mechanics and they're fatigued. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I found it fascinating seeing, uh, especially in, in kids like, you know, these teenage kids that, that started what they call mewing, uh, you know, putting the, the, your tongue on the roof of your mouth and, and holding it there throughout the day. And then also doing almost like sets, uh, like kind of like what you mentioned, but seeing these before and after pictures of like six, nine, 12 month, um, periods where, you know, these kids go from having no chin and it's totally underdeveloped and they, and they can't breathe where the shit and they look weird to, you know, a year from then, uh, or a year later, like they've got this super developed, uh, like almost massive fucking very well proportioned balanced jaw as well as straight teeth. Um, is that like one of the, the kind of, I don't even know if I'd call it a theory. I mean, there it seems like there's enough kind of empirical data to, to back it up is that, you know, like human beings aren't, aren't really meant to, or shouldn't need braces, but most kids do now because they eat such soft foods as young kids and, and don't, uh, have have the room in their mouth from their their tongues and and being in the wrong place and not chewing properly and, and what have you and, and having shitty posture and, and all of that kind of being connected to where like if their tongue isn't in the right place and their palate is too small if their palate's too small then their teeth are fucked up and if that's fucked up then their mm. their esophagus and airway is fucked up and if that like it, it's all connected and, and it's like the root cause, <clears throat> root cause of so many fucking problems in, in kids nowadays. And, and even studies showing uh, Alzheimer's being correlated to really shitty posture because there's a, a cutoff of brain and cerebral spinal fluid as, as people age and their posture gets shittier and weaker and whatever is that, uh, you know, without blood, proper blood flow and, and spinal fluid to the brain is that it's, it's no different than like wrapping a fucking rubber band around your, uh, finger or whatever is that the, like that tissue is going to start to die and whatever it's, to me it's fascinating that there's something so simple but that is so uh, prolific and and connected to to so many other things that nobody really talks about it's like jaw implants and fucking sleep masks and uh, you know and, and surgeries and drugs and all these other things that historically like we never had access to but human beings never really needed either so uh, do you have a, an opinion or a take on any of that? I think I'd have to look more into it but definitely makes a lot of sense yeah it definitely makes a lot of sense and the further removed we get from how we were designed the more problems we have yeah yeah I mean it's fascinating shit for sure I, I, I love stuff like that and to me, anytime you can uh, do something simple like that and not have surgery or, or drugs to fix it, I'm, I'm always a fan of that. But um, steroids, uh, performance enhancing drugs, et cetera. Um, it, would you say that there's an element of it's like with most things in, in moderation, there are, are components of that that are beneficial or are you just not a fan of it at all? Or what is your take? So steroids, I would consider different than performance enhancing drugs or hormone replacement. So if we start with hormone replacement, testosterone, HCG, which is not necessarily hormone replacement, but all along the same vein, I think that to replenish the body of something that is depleted to bring an individual to a more normal range is perfectly acceptable. Assuming that they don't have any risks, obviously check with your doctor. I'm not giving them medical advice. But I, I think that there is room for that. I do that in my practice. In terms of performance enhancing drugs, I think it depends on in what context we're talking about it. The one risk I see with them is if we were to say that they're okay and then the younger kids take it. Yeah. I'm not talking about adults. Adults, you do whatever you want. You're personally responsible for yourself. I'm not saying go and, and take performance-enhancing drugs, but if you want to, no one's going to stop you. 
But when where the I, I think personally the issue is is again if it gets down to the children, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Mm-hmm. I think that that's where the issue is. Yeah. Are they? Um, you know, again, it all depends on what it is. Yeah. Is there a, uh, from a performance enhancing drug, I guess, how, how would you categorize the difference between, say, anabolic steroids meant purely for building muscle and strength yeah. versus a quote unquote performance enhancing drug? Like, how would you? I think it just depends on what kind of drug. So, an anabolic steroid would fall under the umbrella of performance enhancing drug. Um, uh, what would be some of the other ones? Blood doping drugs would be considered performance. EPO enhancing. and yep. stuff like that. Would be considered performance enhancing drugs. Even peptides, which are allowed outside of sport, which are um, many physicians prescribe peptides, uh, they are not allowed inside of sports. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not sure if they are classified as performance enhancing, but in terms of recovery agents or something like CJC and ipamorlin, which is a growth hormone ag- analog those are considered within sports performance enhancing. Yeah. So you have the illegal and then the legal. Yeah. To me, what would be helpful, again, in, in the same vein as the supplements, uh, vitamin, mineral mm-hmm. supplementation, would be a list of, you know, good and bad for whether it's PEDs or, uh, or hormones, steroids, you know, whatever, is that some are inherently just fucking bad for you and there's no two ways about yeah. it. And other ones are actually helpful in the right you know, whatever. So that, that is, there are certain anabolic steroids that I think are very helpful, but are, they're very restricted for perform for prescription. Yeah. Can for like example, um, people have heard about DECA, right? Mm-hmm. DECA, you know, you heard about it. Oh yeah. I, I was in the Navy. <laughs> exactly. But there are two indications for that. Yeah. And that would be anemia, chronic anemia, and also osteoporosis. But it, it's you know, has benefits for both of those things. That's not to say that it wouldn't have benefits for other things, but physicians like myself can't prescribe it for other things. Yeah. Is, is that one of those things where it's a, like a little goes a long way, like where, where the problem oh, yeah. comes in is when people yeah, yeah. use too much of it. And it. Yeah. And I also think that as physicians, we have restrictions on um, what we can and cannot prescribe. Yeah. Even if um, in our minds we would say, okay, well, this, this could potentially be really good. For like sarcopenia, we're still trying to figure out what is usable for sarcopenia, which is a, a decrease in muscle mass and really strength, which is diapenia, but it's that tissue changes of muscle. Because yeah. muscle is an organ. We're just still so in, in its infancy. These conversations are still in its infancy, right? So people can take thyroid hormone and have no issue. And and there may be other medications to address a thyroid, but when it comes to skeletal muscle mass, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, because of the bad rap that anabolics have gotten, it's very difficult to address what potentially could be optimal for skeletal muscle because of restrictions in medicine. So, I mean, I get the restriction. Well, I actually don't get the restrictions even in, in performance of, of what the, like why there's such a, a heartburn and a and a an antagonist view towards I don't know towards them in sports. Like I, I, I understand why they, they do that. I don't agree with it. Uh, in that, you know, to me it's kind of a where do you draw the line, right? Is it say um the New York Yankees versus a, a brand new team? You know, it's like, well there there's because the it seems like the, the angle is, well, it's an unfair advantage. It's like, well, first of all, if everybody can take it, then it's not an unfair advantage, right? right? So then it's, well, it's because it's bad for you. It's like, well, so are fucking Snickers bars, but you're not going to not let your athletes eat those. To me, the biggest thing, though, is it's like, well, if the Yankees have way more money to hire better trainers, coaches, have better facilities, have better everything, like, well, isn't that an unfair advantage? I mean, I know there's salary caps, but – you know, that, that doesn't include all of the other resources that they can pay for and, and give their athletes access to that, you know, is inherently an advantage over a, a brand new team that has a quarter of the budget or whatever. And so to me, it, it all seems kind of like muddy water and bullshit and, and, and like a bit of a shell game when you start asking, you know, why, which leads me to the question of, from your perspective, is there a, are there performance enhancing drugs in, in, Ster- anabolic steroids that don't really have 
what you would consider uh, detrimental side effects that, that like if there were no rules that you would say, yeah, I think it's fine to take that. So I think everything, ha you have to pay the piper no matter what. Mm -hmm. Everything has side effects. Everything, when you introduce something into a system, there's always a repercussion. For example, when you give exogenous testosterone, even if your levels are low, sperm production goes down. Your that's natural good. production. That's good news for most people. <laughs> yeah, that's what my husband says. <laughs> um, so there are... There, there's always a result, right? Things don't exist in, iso in isolation. Is that a bad thing? Well, yeah. I mean, maybe it's not a bad thing for the individual, but it does have the influence of shutting down natural testosterone production. Yeah. Any kind of performance enhancing drug, again, there are so many, is not without risk. And you just have to understand if you are someone who is at risk. And how you would do that is you would certainly look at blood lipids, and just the real deep profiles, also liver enzymes, all kinds of things, understanding what does your vasculature look like? Yeah. What does your heart look like? Getting not just a, a, a echo, but getting a clearly scan or a calcium score imaging of the heart. Yeah. Okay. And really understanding what are you willing to do? What are the risks you're willing to take? But again, everything is not, everything is not risk free. Yeah. There, there's nothing that's a, yeah, it's fine. It's a freebie. It's no, everything has an impact. Everything, including yeah. even thyroid hormone. Yeah. When you take, let's say you're hypothyroid and you need thyroid, it still shrinks your thyroid. So like, one of the things that uh, I know is banned and has, has been kind of a hotbed topic is HGH, right? You hear that a lot about yeah. that in sports, but you know, if, as people age, uh, what is your recommendation or I guess just take, do you, do you think as you get older, it's okay, or, or is there a huge side effect? This is a great question. It's a great question. Um, I do not prescribe HGH, and the reason I don't prescribe it is because I would have to show that an individual failed a, a growth hormone stimulation test. To be able to legally prescribe yeah. it? If that wasn't the case, would you? I would probably try CJC and Ipamorlin first, which I do utilize in my practice, and that's a, a peptide um, I would try that first yeah. and I would put them on a really good training regimen and make sure they're sleeping and see what their body is able to do. Yeah. Because again, nothing is risk-free. Yeah. That, uh, this is kind of an odd, oddball question, but it popped in my mind as you mentioned, mentioned sleep. Uh, are you a proponent of not having caffeine after a certain time? Nope. Really? I am a mom of two children and a business owner. So you're drinking caffeine at 9.30. All day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm is like, it always oh, coffee? Oh, shit, it's 5 p.m. I have uh, about five more hours of work to yeah. do, and that's not going to start till 7, so. Yeah. What is it always coffee or what? No, I love iced tea. Really? I love coffee, too. Yeah. So, uh, Powdered you, coffee, coffee in a can, herba mate. Are you ever drinking diet soda? No. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming you recommend not drinking diet soda. Yeah. No, because it's just try to, again, Coffee is more of a whole food, unadulterated yeah. kind of a thing. I got you. I'm just trying to get uh, somebody to give me a free pass on drinking <laughs> diet. You've been herbal. drinking diet soda forever. My whole life. Forever? My whole, my whole life, yeah. I've, I have gone periods where it was, it was a little over a year where I drank no, no diet soda whatsoever, and I, I didn't feel any fucking difference. Is that true? It's I vaguely accurate. remember you cut out artificial sweetener. Maybe it was gum or something? No, everything. I mean, for, for it was a little over a year, and this was probably seven or eight years ago. It was like 14 months of no soda, no fucking any, any <laughs> artificial, I mean, almost no artificial sweetener and no diet soda and whatever. For Yeah, it was a little over a year. There was no discernible difference that I could tell. And and it wasn't like three weeks. I was like, no, I don't feel any different, so I'm going back on. I mean, to me, like a, a year is... That's substantial. At, 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 that, at that point, like I, I wasn't even missing it really, you know. Why'd you go back? Um, I, I think it was out of... I wouldn't say convenience, but it was like a, at that time, I was traveling a lot. And it was like, you know, a, as I'm eating, whether it's in a hotel or, or a restaurant or whatever, it's just... It's like, oh, soda sounds good. I'm, you know, and, and it wasn't like, holy fuck, I've missed this stuff. It just kind of like gradually went back into, into drinking it again, and then and then was drinking it again. But um, anyway, I mean, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I was debating talking about this, but I'll mention something. All right, you're asking about performance enhancing, and you know, there's there's 
again, we were talking about more anabolic type stuff, but things like nicotine. Yeah. And I'm not talking about uh, smoking cigarettes. I'm talking about nicotine gum, caffeine. Vaping. <laughs> not vaping, but there are things that really can improve cognition. Yeah. Again, not without depleting your dopamine, not without depleting, not without having some kind of issue. So nicotine depletes dopamine? It can. Really? I mean, what about the uh, the vasoconstrictor aspect of it? Or, or are you saying like in low... Super low. Nicotine amounts. can definitely do. Nicotine can definitely affect dopamine in terms of sucralose. I don't know. Um, you know, it's mechanism of action of effect. Yeah, interesting. Um, the but from the a high blood pressure standpoint, I mean, isn't nicotine a pretty big culprit of the vasoconstrictor aspect? I mean, I think with high blood pressure, it definitely can be multifactorial, and you would also want to avoid. Yes, so I would. Consider avoiding nicotine. I would consider avoiding really any stimulants. Yeah. Depend, and then also get your blood pressure managed. Yeah. If it's a problem. If it's a problem. Uh, but it's all about how can you take this stuff and and have longevity with it. Yeah. Um, from a uh, like a, a depression and anti-depression SSRI antipsychotic, like all the different big pharma. Mm-hmm massively uh, diagnosed and prescribed medications that fall into those categories. Uh, what is your, your opinion on those? I feel very privileged to have trained two years in psychiatry at the University of Louisville, and, and I trained as a psychiatrist. And I will tell you, the brain is an organ just like the heart, just like the thyroid, just like muscle. When individuals are severely affected, they deserve treatment without a stigma. Meaning the person itself, if they really need it, they're having horrible anxiety, having major kind of depressive episodes, I absolutely believe in treatment. I have no issue with the SSRI, I have no issue with the SNRI, any of those. Obviously you have to do it from a holistic approach, uh, make sure diet, and and there's a, a great physician named Chris Palmer, He he really believes in a ketogenic style diet for treating these kinds of things. But I will say, even if you take a medication to bridge the gap, I don't believe people should suffer. No, I, I don't disagree with that. I guess I just the, it seems like, you know, looking at the the statistics on the amount of prescriptions of, of some of those, it's pretty fucking staggering. Yeah, it's all staggering. And, and part of that is we are an immediate gratification society as opposed to cultivating over time our own wherewithal. And if we do that, then the needs for external things can become less. Yeah. I mean, is it accurate to say that um, environmental, you know, whether you want to call it epigenetics or, or a combination of diet, lifestyle, overall health, the role that that plays in a necessity for SSRI type type medication and things like that. How big of a role do you think that plays? I think it's huge. I think, of course, it depends on the severity of the disease, but it's huge. Yeah. And the other thing is, I mentioned this earlier, is people have to actually be living in alignment with what they feel their true calling is. Yeah. And I don't mean to sound cheesy in any capacity, but being idle and not executing a life worth meaning, whatever that is to the person. Out of all my patients, that has been probably the biggest driver for depression. Yeah. Is someone who is not living the life that they felt that they should or doing the thing that they feel is contributing in the way that they feel. Yeah, lack of purpose. Yeah. Yeah. That, that probably, right? So it doesn't matter how much money you have. Yeah. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. You have to be living in alignment. Yeah. Not, yeah, I've been in, in a unique position to have met uh, quite a few folks over the last uh, you know, 13, 14 years of, of doing what I do and, and, uh, you know, that, that are massively successful, you know, and, and some of them, uh, are some of the kindest, happiest, most pleasant people you've ever met. And some of them are, are fucking visually miserable, you know, and, and you can tell like they're, they just, you know, you know, they're, they're about two shitty days away from jumping off of a fucking bridge, you know, and, uh, and and it really boils down to that is is that you know I'm not not a psychiatrist I'm not a, a doctor I'm not a scientist whatever but in my casual abs- observation it seems pretty apparent that uh, you know that the the money or success aspect uh, is kind of like steroids in a way in, in that it it enhances what's already there 
you know, so if you're miserable, like it'll actually make you more miserable because now you have even less things to worry about and no struggle and more time on your hands. Uh, and, and that's kind of a, the worst combination on the transverse. Like if you're already happy and purpose, purposeful, um, you know, money just seems to add to, um, the, the pleasure of, of those experiences and, and your ability to, to pay it forward and to enjoy your life and, and still have fun and, and be happy and, and even lower stress because you're, you're not worried about money. But uh, that's my... I, I totally agree. I take. actually, on my way here, we flew out of um, Newark Airport. Have you been to Newark Airport? Yeah. Miserable. Yeah. Nobody's smiling. I mean, that's just a real shithole. <laughs> um, and... Obviously, I'm traveling with two kids, two car seats. It's just the whole thing. And this porter came up and, you, you know, he helped me load everything up. And he's like, hey. And he was super upbeat. I don't know. He was in his late 50s, early 60s, just super upbeat. And his name is Henry. And we're walking to, you know, coordinate all this stuff. The kids are screaming. Who knows? Food's flying everywhere. And he, I was like, Henry, you know, how long have you been at this job? And he takes off his hat. He's bald. And he said, since for 33 years, I've been here for 33 years. And I said, well, do you like it? He said, I love it. Every day I come to work, the people here are so nice. Oh, shit. Yeah. You're like, where where do you work? Exactly. (laughs) And here's what else he tells me. He said, I tried to quit because they don't offer me benefits. It's been there for 33 years. Jesus. I tried to quit, but they don't offer me benefits, but I couldn't leave all the people that I help. That's amazing. And again, I set this story up because Newark is, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you are like public enemy number one if you are just like walking. Yeah. And it was all his experience. Wow. He's, wor- he's been there 33 years and not, doesn't have benefits. That's incredible. Because he feels that everybody is so happy and friendly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's. And he's uh, talking about the people, the patrons like yeah. me, the <laughs> yeah, the miserable wretches. Miserable. That, well, yeah, I guess that's that's all perspective and uh, and in the eye of the beholder, right? Uh, last thing I have written down is joint health, just kind of broad spectrum wise. Yeah. Uh, can you shed any light on uh, on how to maintain that? Yes, there's a lot of science that has evolved in that area, especially when it comes to regenerative care, like stem cell type stem stuff. Stem cell. Plasma, bone grafting, fat grafting. There is a tremendous amount of movement above and beyond the cortico, you know, corticosteroid shot <coughs> or cortisone shot. In terms of joint health, again, those those peptides that I had mentioned, whether it's BPC or TB five hundred, I don't think I mentioned them by name, but depending on how aggressive one needs to be, we live a lot longer. The you know, try not to be overweight. Try not to tax your joints, but if you are very athletic and most people, you know, in your position have been really looking into the regenerative care. Is there a, I, I remember seeing a, a Remy actually yeah, posted something about some shoulder I stuff. And he, he mentioned, yep. yeah, what, uh, what, what was the deal with that? Yeah. So he, I, I think he mentioned in it that he just had some shoulder issues, whether it was a labrum tear, I don't remember exactly. But regenerative therapy, when done appropriately, can be very helpful. Yeah, and how? I mean, is that uh, when Spend you have your that, own plasma? Does that keep you down for a while afterwards? Depends on the injury. Typically, not so much a shoulder. Yeah, they want you moving it pretty quickly. I actually had stem cells, so I tore my last interview where everyone was giving me a hard time for moving so much. I actually had a, a <laughs> left a voles hamstring, so oh, I wow. had torn my hamstring off the bone about eighty percent. Jeez! And I went through a couple years of regenerative treatment yeah and uh did that fix fix everything yeah it's a little hurting now because i was trying some sprint um activities yesterday so it's a little yeah. sore today yeah. but otherwise the tear actually healed yeah awesome uh in terms of out, outside of regenerative stuff in terms of um say from a nutrition standpoint yeah. uh, things that that are a little more over the counter and, and more accessible i mean i think collagen again i i, I don't know if we have quote, evidence yet, but sometimes evidence takes a long time. But higher dose collagen anecdotally can is thought to be very helpful. Yeah. Glucosamine works in some people. Um, uh, can also do higher dose fish oils. For pain, also, there's something called SPMs, which is a somewhat of an intermediate, which a lot of the guys are on. All what of those are, can those? be helpful. What are SPMs? 
SPMs are, it's an intermediate. It's like a, uh, I don't remember what it stands for. It's, um, it's not a fish oil, but it's an inner, it's in that cascade. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've heard that before. It, so, it sounds uh, vaguely familiar. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. But uh, how do you acquire those? Just Google it. Yeah. There's a couple companies that make it. Okay. I can get those to you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, very expensive. That's more for pain? Yeah, it's for pain. You said it's very expensive or not? It very? is very expensive, oh, okay. um, but it is for pain. Uh, I know you said joint health, but joint health typically leads to pain, and it's really the pain that people are trying to deal with. And then there may be some evidence that higher dose fish oil yeah. can be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Again, it's you know the question is is it arthritic? Is it osteoarthritis? Yeah. Is it inflammatory? What is the What's the it reason? Stem from? Yeah, yeah. What is it? But typically overuse. Yeah. Um, kinds of issues yeah. or too much diet soda <laughs> or too much diet soda. Yeah. Um, that's uh, th those are all the topics I have written down. Um, are there any that, uh, that you wanted to bring up that kind of fall into the same vein of what we've been talking about that we didn't? Um, I, I think that we've touched upon everything. What I do think is really important for the listener to understand is they're getting more access to information than they've ever had before mm -hmm. in the health, wellness, nutrition world. Yeah. And instead of it actually helping people, I think it's very detrimental. I think it creates confusion and paralysis. I would recommend that people find individuals they trust, always understand what is the motive and who stands to benefit yeah. from this. That's with everything, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, but, but I, you know, I'm not an expert yeah. in everything, yeah. but uh, you know, the question becomes who, who stands to benefit when you yeah. hear these narratives being pushed. Yeah. The, uh, the impossible burgers and beyond meat products. Exactly. Yeah. There is so much crap in those. I, I hate to see, uh, such a push for all that stuff. Exactly. But, yeah. Uh, who is benefiting from that? Do you know? Like, yeah. The big food companies. Yeah. The uh, big food companies are trying to create the great reset. Yeah. Cause they can cut farmers and ranchers out yep. and now just create like it's all in house. It's yep. created and packaged and, and they own it and yeah. they make money from it and they yeah. control the food supply. Yeah. It's bad. That's a whole other episode on it. In that a, is in a itself. whole other episode. I really encourage if anyone is interested to read yeah. up on the quote, great reset. Yeah. All right. Is there like a, uh, a documentary or anything? That no, you, you know? no, but um, there's some, again, that um, Leroy, Frederick Leroy. Oh, okay. Talks a lot about it. Uh, some great papers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where can, uh, can we as the listener find, yeah. uh, find you? You can find me on Instagram, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Also my show, the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon show, unique, I know. My website, if someone wants to apply to be a patient, they can sign up for my newsletter. Uh, I have a free protocol. I try to provide a ton of free information also on YouTube. I do a ton of videos, all free to the listener. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we talked uh, a little bit about you uh, taking me on as a client as far as uh, kind of going through all of the Yeah, the I've been blood trying to get you in my practice yeah. for two years now. So, so here's what's going to happen is we're, we're going to kick that process off and I'm going to kind of document it on, uh, on here. So, uh, so I'm going to give, give you guys in uh, a look into my life and what my blood looks like and, and all that other shit. He's going to uh, wish he didn't yeah. do that. <laughs> we're, we're, but we're going to stay within the HEPA guidelines right now. We're, <laughs> we're going to share everything. Worms coming out of my ass and everything. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming, uh, coming back. Uh, I, I always appreciate the wealth of knowledge that you bring to the table. And, uh, it, to me, it's fascinating to, to be able to, to ask somebody that I know and trust, um, you know, their opinion on, on all of these things that, that I constantly have questions about and, or come across in, uh, in pop culture, the media, and just in day-to-day -day life that, uh, I appreciate your expertise. Oh, thank on. you. Can I leave you with two more things? Yeah. I work with a foundation called Hunter Seven Foundation. Yeah. Have you heard of them? I have. Um, Chelsea and the team, I spend a lot of my extra time and I think that anyone out there should check them out. They're really trying to pave the way and protect the military from exposures. Like toxic exposures. Yes, stuff, yeah. very, very important. And then uh, Seal Future Foundation also yeah. helps with the support of the guys. Yeah. So that I can take care of them. So Hunter Seven Foundation and Seal Future Foundation, yeah. which we'll uh, we'll link in the uh, description. And doing and really good work in the world, both. Yeah. Is. Amen. Well, thank you again. I appreciate yeah. you coming. Uh, great seeing you. Uh, looking Promise forward. I won't be pregnant next time. Yeah. Well, there's uh, there's always number three, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, looking forward to linking up with uh, Shane and the kids at some point this week. So 
I appreciate you coming. Uh, for those of you, I hope you enjoyed it. She's a wealth of knowledge, and uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you. If you didn't like it, choke yourself. Uh, and until next time, this is Mike Drop. Mm-hmm.